If you go into the show notes right now, I found an awesome paper that you can check out right before we even get into it to learn a little bit of something. I got it from Ed Young on Twitter, and it is basically a scientific paper about the world records for spiders. Yeah, everything spider that you could ever want. Biggest spider, fastest spider, longest fang spider, most venom deposited through those fangs spider. Oh yeah, and they also have the weirdest hunting strategy spider, and I absolutely must ruin your day with this. This is a purse web spider, a kind of spider I've never heard of before, and their hunting strategy is to basically create a tube out of silk that they lay vertically against tree trunks and stuff, and this tube is squishy and they can move up and down it, and what they're doing is waiting for something to step on the squishy tube, which sounds really bad as I say it out loud. But when something does step on the squishy tube, as you can see from this diagram, the spider is waiting for it and it shoots its fangs through the tube walls and pierces the insect and then pulls it inside, as you can see in this disturbing video. Wow. If I was that cricket, that would be terrifying. And I've seen the acting in Spider-Man 3. And welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections, and I award super nerds for the over-analysis of media and life in general. Wow. Not all heroes wear capes, but we talk about the ones that do. Yes! Also, I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's kind of the look I'm going for right now. But getting right into it, on the last episode of Because Science, we were talking about how best to fight a velociraptor. <laughs> That's right, just like when I told you how to fight a T-Rex with help of evolutionary biomechanist John R. Hutchinson, we are back. Oh, the duo's back, baby, and we are fighting velociraptors this time, the real animal as we describe in the literature and not necessarily in Jurassic Park. I said that the animal is basically a turkey with a bunch of sharp stuff on it, so if you had a weapon, like a gun, that's pretty much game over for the Velociraptor, but if you had to fight it, mano e Alyssa Milano, <laughs> you should probably use your weight to an advantage and get behind it and strangle it or do something with its head and neck until you win. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Chris who says, if you really wanted to know how to fight a Velociraptor, just watch a video of an angry cassowary. All right. Wow. A cassowary approaching you is one of the scariest things I've ever seen. <laughs> and I've seen the acting in Spider-Man 3. But yeah, cassowaries and shoebills, if you want to look up those birds, are basically the best representation of what dinosaurs used to look like. They just look like we think dinosaurs looked like in terms of size. They're, they're big and they're kind of mean looking. They got these giant claws. So yeah, cassowaries are terrifying and they kill people. Uh, so don't fight one. But if you had to, I'm just saying, don't. Our next comment comes from an actual spider, nice, who says at the very end, I'd like to thank you for not using pop culture distance raptor over time raptor equals velociraptor, as we all know that raptors would cancel out in that equation and we'd only be left with velocity. <laughs> Boo! Nice. Of course, we got another one of those, though, from Super Nerd Science with Steph, who says, This video is wrong. Everyone knows that Velociraptors equals distance raptor over time. <laughs> uh, no, you're wrong, Super Nerd Science with Steph. Everyone knows that Velociraptor equals integral raptor of a cello raptor over time. Duh. <laughs> huh? Our next comment comes from Dan Ray, who says, this smells like a new series, how to fight something and win. Yeah, sure, why not? If you want me to analyze how you should fight something real, fictional, or extinct, <laughs> let me know in the comments below, and maybe we'll get to it. Want to find a Stegosaurus? Ho, oh, who knows? Want to fight a Xenomorph? I'll get back to you. Want to fight the entire Borg? I don't know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay, I'm already laughing, because the nerdiest comment of this week I gotta give to Wilhelm Gard from Skyrim, who says, Praise Talos, what would I do? I'd grab it by the neck, then throw my weight over it, pin it down, and then choke it to death. How do they know this? Because they go on to say, Yeah, I've wrestled geese when I was a toddler. 
never choked them to death, but they always pecked me and pitched me with their beaks. So one day I grabbed one and did just that to exert dominance. Like you do. This comment is so bonkers, or honkers if you're a goose, whoo, that you have to be a super nerd just for fighting geese as a baby and then telling all of us about it. So you, Will Helm Guard, are indeed a storm cloak. Nope, sorry. Do you know what they just released? Skyrim on the watch. But of course, I'm not always right. I thought True Detective season two looked good and then it really wasn't. So what did I get wrong this week, last week? Dang! Our first correction comes from Greasy T, you, and Tobias Bergstrom and Crispy Nugget, you, who, <laughs> who all say, they said emus aren't smart like we consider ravens to be smart, and they say, well, emus beat the Australian military in a war, so maybe they are clever girls. Okay, so I didn't know about this weird internet thing. Apparently, uh, decades and decades ago, uh, emus, We'll get to that. Emus were overrunning the Australian countryside and eating a lot of crops, so uh, the military gave people guns, and even some of the military, I believe, gave people guns and just said, cull all the emus. Start shooting them. And there were so many that the emus won. So that's fun, but it doesn't mean an animal is really smart, right? Uh, are the wild boars that people in Texas are being contracted to fly in helicopters and shoot super smart? Eh. Are locusts smart? No. Just because an animal's population is very hard to control and they reproduce a lot and they eat a lot of crops and they're especially cantankerous does not mean that they are necessarily clever girls. Uh, Y'all ain't giving ravens enough credit. They solve puzzles. Our next two corrections come from people who have Something to say about my pronunciation of words again. Uh, the first comes from Prodigal Kid who says, you pronounce Dionychus as Dionychus. It's supposed to be Dionychus. All right, well, I've always said Dionychus as a kid. Let's go to the experts. Dionychus. Dionychus. Fine. Dionychus. What does the next one say? You pronounced emu, not emu. All right, let's go to the expert. Emu. Emu. Fine. I didn't know you had to say emu like you were Australian. That right there is an emu. Is that Australian? No. Hey, hey, you gonna, uh, hey, you gonna have a walkabout? Maybe say an emu. Okay, I get it. Emus, Deinonychus. I am now 100% correct. Our next correction comes from Zach D, who says, uh, hate to break it to you, but Deinonychus was not human-sized. Okay, let's go to the chart. Hmm. So they could be up to 11 feet long. They didn't stand, you know, taller than a human, but they could be, some estimates have them at around 200 pounds. If something 11 feet long that stands about up to your chest and weighs 200 pounds, if that's not human-sized, how big are the people that you know? But the biggest correction and the nerdiest correction this week I'm giving to a few people and I want to focus on it because I want to give Michael Crichton his novel, the inspiration for the movie, I want to give it all their due because Michael Crichton actually focused much more on the science and trying to get it right than I knew. So, like Love Hawks and Andy J and Chris Helvey in The Great Wolf, uh, Andy J says here, Michael Crichton used the name Velociraptor in the novel as antagonist, in part because the name could be shortened to Raptor. But in the 80s, some paleontologists, led by Gregory S. Paul, proposed lumping Deinonychus under the name and under the genus Velociraptor. Although this taxonomy is no longer accepted, Crichton used it when writing Jurassic Park as it evidenced uh, during Dr. Grant discussing the different species of raptor with Dr. Wu. So basically, what happened was that Deinonychus, the animal, was categorized as a velociraptor at the time Michael Crichton was writing the novel. So to him, trying to get the science right, the animal that he made the antagonist of Jurassic Park was a velociraptor. 
Later, Dionychus was taken out of that classification, so it was no longer technically a true velociraptor. So, Michael Crichton was trying to get the science right, and in doing so, with all the current knowledge that he had, he said that the animal that looked like Deinonychus was in fact a velociraptor. Now, with modern fossils and all the research we have since all the writing was done and the movie was made, now we classify Deinonychus and Velociraptor as two different animals. So, in this video, I wanted to give you an idea of what it would be like to fight a true Velociraptor, but at the time of the writing of the novel and the shooting of the film, Michael Crichton was trying to get the science right, and technically speaking, he did based on the current classification. And in my video, I made it seem like he just picked the name willy-nilly because Velociraptor sounded cool, and that's not exactly true. And for pointing out that technicality and making sure I get my videos right, as well as the science, you are all, oh, first time and happen a tetra super nerd. That means four. Now, if you are subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Science is going to be because you have already seen it two days two days earlier than anyone else. You can't make certain hand gestures anymore. And you saw other premium content from myself, Nerdist, and Geek and Sundry. But if you haven't subscribed to Project Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is How Does Aquaman Swim So Fast? And why do you pronounce words the way you do? And why do you put emphasis on different parts of the sentence that aren't traditional? Just the Aquaman thing. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, I'm covering one big thing that I left out of my first Aquaman video. Namely, how does Aquaman swim so dang fast? Canonically, he can swim supersonically. And I will argue that moving through the water that quickly is even harder than moving through the air that quickly because of the unique challenges that being underwater poses. So how much power would it take to swim like Aquaman? How, what kind of output would his sick legs and glutes need? Where would he get all that energy? Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, and leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. A lot of you have asked me, when is the cutoff point for making this show? Well, there are thousands of comments by the time I film this, but I try to look at the first let's say six hours of comments after the video goes up. So get in quick, get nerdy. And don't forget, socioeconomically speaking, mo' money, fewer problems. We did the studies. <laughs>